Good evening. A huge pall of smoke tonight blankets the Strathtyre area as firefighters battle a big tussock fire high up in the Rock and Pillar Range. Department of Conservation staff at the scene say it's burning over a five-kilometre front and won't be brought under control until tomorrow at the earliest. There's no water available and the 40 firefighters are having to do what they can with shovels. An area of Alpine Reserve that's home to a unique wetter has already been blackened and more damage is expected. What started out as a class assignment for a student at Southland Polytech has ended up in a prominent spot in Invercargill. There was quite a crowd in Wapner Place to see the cast aluminium sculpture created by student John Penisula. A number of local organisations contributed to the cost and at lunchtime today all was revealed. The sculpture is symbolic of a number of Southland events and legends. The whale, which sev served, severed Stewart Island from the mainland, the early European col colonisation and the region's concern for conservation. Ever wondered how horses feel about having horseshoes nailed onto their feet? It's one of those things that reporter Bill Simpson often worries about, so today he was much relieved at some good news for horses. Belvine Castle, a two-year-old thoroughbred. He knows what it's like to have nails driven into his feet. It can hurt. <laughs> Belvin Castle was modelling today, showing off his feet to trainers, vets and farriers. The experts say that a hoof is like your fingernail but much thicker. You can scrape it and file it and it won't hurt. But sometimes the hoof cracks or softens. And that's when nailing a horseshoe on is real agony. So, look at this. A stick-on horseshoe. You could call it the yoo shoe. Therefore, the less glue you can use, the better the bond. Kirk Nicholson, an Australian farrier, is showing the shoe to those in the trade. It's only for horses with problem feet and sore feet. When horses are around, you hesitate to ask where the glue comes from. But, relief all round, it's the new synthetic glues that have made the stick-on shoe possible. The shoes are expensive, $60 each, compared to $10 for an iron one so it's hardly likely to become a good luck charm. It doesn't look quite as pretty on the wall, no, no. Nothing shoddy about that job. Think of rugby players, and chances are the image that comes to mind is of a big brawny character who rules by brawn rather than brain. But Ken Nicholson has a story to tell about an odd quirk in the character of Otago No. 8, Brent Pope. Brent has a hobby which may or may not make him the friends of his Otago teammates. Popey fits the bill of a typical rugby player, He's a big fellow, as hard as teak, and can run like a deer. At one stage, he friends on all black status, and is good enough to still achieve that aim with a little luck on his side. But in the last six weeks or so, he's been injured, and in his spare time, he hasn't always been at the bar with his rugby mates. No, pope has been sitting at a desk writing his second children's book. And since his first, A Whale of a Tale, he's gone up in the world. Not just the ordinary old Brent Pope anymore. Now he's graduated to be Brent M. Pope. But his teammates may have other ideas about his literary talents. His latest hero, Herbie Hotton, the policeman, can only be based on one character, the idol of the Carers Book fans, Steve Hotton. But while Hottie may be proud of his increased fame, a closer look at the script may not please him quite as much. I haven't talked to Hottie lately, so I don't think he'll be too pleased, but he has been down the gym doing sit-ups, so uh, perhaps it's a hint for the future. The point's been made, do you think? The point's been made for the, for the beach this week. Both books have characters well known to Otago rugby fans. Mike Brewer becomes Mario Brewer, the ice cream man. Gordon McPherson becomes a mere. Richard Knight, Rupert to his teammates, is Rupert Knight, the lolly seller. And then there's Hottie. And the eyes give him away. You know, you go along to practice at nights and it seems that a lot of people want to get in the books now. Of, uh, you know, especially Aaron Penny, he's always um, pestering me to be in there, Aaron the Aardvark or something. <laughs> so, uh, no, they treat it. Um, they treat it pretty good, really. The mind boggles at future characters from the Pope Pen, the Gingerbread Man, or maybe Grandpappy Mains. But then again, Popey probably wants to get back into the Otago rugby team. And all proceeds from Brent's latest book go to the Child Cancer Foundation. Now to the work of another well-known author, Roger Hall. He has a hit play doing the rounds in Dunedin, but it's being seen by a smaller, more select audience than usual. The play's about the volunteer service abroad, and Roger's zapped up the image in the way the future volunteers seem to enjoy. Strange land. Exotic places. Unusual people. 
people. She. It's the whole sense of humour again, but this time with a serious message. The play's called You Must Be Crazy. Or is it You Must Be Crazy? These Bayfield College students were left in no doubt about the lack of glamour in the job. Frustrations. frustrations! They told us there could be frustrations, and there were. I had such a romantic vision about becoming a volunteer. That all changed <coughs> very quickly. If machinery breaks down, it takes three or four months to get parts. The electricity system here is appalling. It's not gecko eggs in the fuse box, it's mud wasp nests. If the house catches fire, you're expected to travel half an hour to the fire brigade to pay them before they can put it out. From a thousand applicants, VSA will take only 50, and these people won't even get a shot at it until they're 22. If any of them do get to go, the VSA won't pay a lot, but it will tell them what to take. of today's group is anything to go by, VSA may get a lot of new blood from Roger Hall's play. Uh, I think I might do it. Like, I'll be quite interested in doing something like that. That's great, yeah. yeah. The performers in our next story have a slightly different style, the members of the St Paul's Choir. The choir was formed 130 years ago, but it's only in recent years its fame has spread abroad. It toured for the first time five years ago, and today it set off on its second European tour. Cathy Graham with the story. Choristers of St Paul's are featured regularly on television at home. They sang at Bishop Penny's ordination. It's an all-male tradition, no longer very common in the Anglican world. That makes them very popular abroad. Today they set out on a six-week tour, which will take them to England, Berlin, East and West Germany, Czechoslovakia and Vienna to sing in some of the world's most famous churches. Just organising seats for the 25 choristers, especially the trebles, is a business. But they should be well taken care of. Each gentleman has a, a boy or two to look after, so we're pretty well in a buddy system, and that works extremely well. The boys themselves are looking forward to their first stopover. Disneyland. <laughs> and they're not at all nervous about the prospect of performing. And that's it from us tonight. Have a great weekend. I hope the good weather continues. We'll be back with you on Monday. Good night. <laughs>